When I think about the fact Team Rocket's been around for over 25 years, I'm just baffled. Like, can you believe that? People all over the world know of Jesse, James, Meowth, and Wobbuffet too, and have been loved by many a generation. Heck, they're some of my favorite fictional characters of all time. Still, for as loved as they are, I'm kinda shocked no one's done a big old memoir type video on them. And you know what? I'm not waiting any longer. What I got here for you is an insight into Team Rocket. Stories about their real life origins, the people who made them who they are, and the impact they've made on the world. Obviously, this won't cover everything about them, but I scoured various corners of the internet and even worked with a translator to uncover seldom seen facts, so I guarantee you'll come out of this learning something you never knew before. Unless you speak Japanese, I guess. Speaking of which, I want to give a shout out to Dogasu's Backpack, who is undoubtedly the biggest Team Rocket fan this side of Japan, and possibly the whole planet. For anyone who wants to know about Pokemon in its native land, and from translated interviews, episode comparisons, and a lot more about Team Rocket, that's the place to be. This video and many others like it would not have been possible without his devotion, so check him out. But for now, let's get right into it. Where to begin with Team Rocket, you wonder? Well, I figured we'd start as far back as possible with the creation of the Pokemon anime. In the July 1999 issue of An America Magazine, the show's producer, Takemoto Mori, said production began shortly after Red and Green was released, so about early to mid-1996. Though done by a team separate from the games, there was input given by senior Game Freak members. Pokemon creator Satoshi Tajiri even told show staff to play the games to better understand what they were adapting. Ken Sugimori, Pokemon's chief character designer, supplied concept art for the show, and in 2015, he shared early sketches of the Rocket Trio on Twitter. Some of you have probably seen that Meowth pose on old merchandise, heck, I've got this TV animation card with that same pose on it, but the big takeaways here are Jesse with a whip and James with a hat. These were no doubt lifted from the regular Grunt design, though whips were used by a few other trainers in Gen 1, and Jesse also has one in this magazine from February 98. And interestingly, James and Jesse were seen in Grunt Standard outfits during a mini arc in Johto, hat and all. Sugimori would draw the trio a couple more times after this. He did art of Jesse and her Arbok for Game Freak's website in the 90s, and drew her and James for the trading card game. 1997's Here Comes Team Rocket Card, and its 2004 reprint in EX Rocket Returns. The two are dressed in black, and Jesse's also got Pokeball earrings, which were seen in Sugimori's sketches. As an aside, Meowth had a promo card illustrated by the anime's longtime director, Kunihiko Uyama. There's even a clause on the original card saying it can't evolve into Persian. See what I did there? Clause? Claw? Yeah. Yeah, you saw it. <laughs> the first time people outside Japan saw the trio, and Pokemon as a whole, may have been in the July 97 issue of Nintendo Power, which had a four-page spread talking up the series' success in Japan. Here, Pokemon are referred to by their Japanese names, your rival is called Takeshi, rather than Shigeru, and Team Rocket was known as the Rocket Society. On the last page, they mention the TV show, and Jesse and James are sporting black uniforms once again. These were also seen in Japanese promo material, like the April 97 issue of Koro Koro Special. But as you know, these didn't last. This art of Meowth also has cream-colored ears, and I've heard some say this could have been a switch up for the show, but it's just a mistake. In some animation reference sheets I had translated, they make special note of how Meowth ears should be colored, with the rim being black and everything else being cream colored. Still, the miscolored ears show up in a few other Koro Koro issues, early merchandise, and in the anime, it's been a recurring error that still happens even today. And check out this magazine from October 97. Meowth's ears, tail, and feet are colored black, right beside a screenshot from the show. W whoops! Before we get into these three as characters, there's two things you ought to know. If you've been around the Pokey block, you may have heard a thing or two about the man behind them. That man was Takeshi Shudo, Pokemon's head writer for its first few years. He named Team Rocket, came up with their motto, these three were his babies, and he talked a fair bit about them on his personal blog. Thanks in no small part to my good man Dr. Lava and his sources, I was able to scour through all 225 entries and even get a few excerpts translated for this video. I also need to give a primer on the voices of Team Rocket. Pokemon's been dubbed in many languages and there's a lot of takes on the trio out there, but the ones we'll mainly focus on are the original Japanese. Megumi Hayashibara as Jesse, or Musashi, Shinichiro Miki as James, or Kojiro, 
and Inuko Inuyama as Meowth, or Nyasu. Simply put, these guys are Team Rocket. They record as an ensemble, they've had the most opportunities to develop the trio, portray them in several forms of media. I wish other dubs got to do half of what they can, and if you don't know much about them, well, your mind's about to be blown. Recounting how they got their roles, Jesse's origins have the most info surrounding them. Many of the details I bring up come from Megumi Hayashibara's 2021 memoir, The Characters Taught Me Everything, available in both Japanese and English, a real lifesaver for me. Before Pokemon, Megumi first worked with Takeshi Shudo on 1990's Idol Angel Yoko So Yoko, and worked closer with him and Yuyama on the 91 Minky Momo series where she voiced the titular character. This sparked a friendship that led to her voicing Musashi, but at first she thought that name sounded boring, likely because it derived from legendary swordsman Miyamoto Musashi, who alongside Sasaki Kojiro have been portrayed in media countless times. Apparently it's also an unusual name for a woman, but she chalks it up to Shudo being Shudo, going against the grain. In the days of Minky Momo, the show's crew went for dinner and drinks after recording sessions, and Shudo encouraged the younger scriptwriters to get to know Megumi better as a person, picking up on her quirks and using them later for her character. As a result, she forged a few friendships with some of these writers. One story she talked about a lot with them were her days in nursing school, a detail which was later added to Jessie's backstory in the episode Ignorance is Blissy. Megumi credits Shudo for picking up that detail, though the episode itself was written by Junki Takegami. Takegami and Akemi Omode, among others, were responsible for a number of big Jessie Team Rocket moments over the years, and both of whom also worked on Minky Momo. When Megumi sees a Pokemon script with a writer's name she recognizes, even now she gets all emotional and nostalgic. Megumi also mentions the iconic Rocket motto, but I need to go back to Shudo for a quick second for this. On his blog, he recalls being at the anime's launch party, which was attended by staff of the show and the games. The trio's actors were there too, and at some point they came up to him, recited the motto, and basically demanded he make it a mainstay. They said, We will without fail, without changing a word, recite this motto whenever we appear in the show, and we will make it popular. Shudo was really happy to hear that, as he put a lot of thought into their lines. Back to Megumi, she says long, flashy introductions are usually reserved for heroes, but that the trio always does things their own way. The line about protecting the world also doesn't sound villainous, but she says it truly is their goal, even if everyone says otherwise. And their outfits, which she thinks were made white to set them apart from other grunts, are all straight from Shudo's soul, though their signature blast-off line was her idea. The original script called for them to just scream, but Megumi wanted something added so they didn't seem too pathetic, and came up with Yana Kanji, which roughly translates to, this sucks. Funnily, the English dub didn't pick this up in their debut, and they did just scream, but they figured it out soon enough. She also recounts when she made a request to staff about Jessie's character, the only time she's ever done so in her career. In the past, Jessie often got her way with verbal or physical abuse, usually directed at her team members. Megumi felt that went against Shudo's concept of good-natured villain and the trio's love and support for each other. She knew Jessie was tough, but she wanted those more violent traits nixed, which James and Meowth's actors also agreed to. She only asked as she was very close with staff, being on the show for over a decade by that point. The request came after Shudo's passing, which was October 29th, 2010. Now by then, the Diamond and Pearl series ended a month prior, and the series following it? Well, this request wouldn't go into effect right away, at least not how she'd expect, but we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. Now let's talk about the things that inspired Team Rocket. In terms of their inspirations, there's a few claims surrounding them. The big one that gets tossed around is the evil trio from the Time Bokan anime, and this one has some truth to it. Time Bokan debuted in the 70s, and being one of the earliest anime to ever be produced, it was influential to shows that followed. The Time Skeletons, as they're called, laid the groundwork for anime's evil trios trope, known in Japanese as Sanyaku, or literally, three evils. Their influence can be seen with groups like Dragon Ball's Pilaf Gang or the grandest gang in Nadia, Secret of the Blue Water. For Pokemon, the animation team did have them in mind, but Shudo says they were used more as a jumping off point than anything. On his blog, he wrote, It's often said Team Rocket were created with a purposeful awareness of the evil trios from Time Bokan. While I might have presented them to the producers at the beginning of series planning as an example to make Team Rocket easier to understand, 
they've taken on their own subtle nuances since I became the main writer for the series. The evil trios of Time Bokan are the so-called losers, clowns who are punished by their evil boss when they screw up and grumble about it when it happens. But Team Rocket are equally half-witted and keep clumsily losing time and time again, but they're confident in their existence and never consider themselves losers. They have their own policies, and even if these policies are somewhat out of line with the norm, they still insist on their own existence. And I know he made these characters, but he's totally right. If you told the Pilaf gang to their face that they sucked, they'd probably be like, yeah, yeah, we kinda suck, yeah, not gonna lie. But if you said that to Team Rocket, all three of them would be like, excuse you? What did you just say? It also took Pokemon over 20 years and a thousand episodes before they even directly referenced Time Bokan, so take that piece of info however you like. For singular members, they have their own alleged inspirations, with the following being the most common I've seen. For Jesse, it's the Skeleton Crew's Majo and an ex-girlfriend of Takeshi Shudo. For James, Leonardo Medici Bundle from the 80s anime Sengoku Majin Go Shogun, and Meowth, Muttley from Hanna-Barbera's Wacky Races. As far as I know, these claims come from an old fan site called Encyclopedia Pokemonica, only accessible now through the Wayback Machine. When I made my first video on Shudo in 2015, I went here for a few facts, and while it has some credibility, oddly, most of the Team Rocket stuff is unverified. I'll try breaking down where each claim might have stemmed from, and I even got some insight from Dogasu's backpack on some of these, so once again, I thank you, Dogasu. In the case of Time Bokan, each series swaps out the old cast with a new one. Every version of the Time Skeletons have different names, but for the most part look very similar to what came before, and often have the same voice actors. If you're familiar with them at all, it's likely their second iteration from the Yatterman series, their most iconic look. When people make a connection between Jesse and Majo, they may be thinking of Yatterman's Doronjo, but Shudo doesn't mention either of them in his blogs. And I feel like you'd name drop your character inspirations rather than saying, oh this guy is based on that one dude from that one show, you know the one, right? As for the girlfriend thing, Dogasu told me he's never seen this claim anywhere else. The Wayback capture I sent was from 2002, so he thinks there may have been something from around that time to make the author say this, but who knows what it was. The Go Shogun claim likely comes from Shudo being that show's chief writer and creator. And as an aside, it was directed by his partner in crime, Yuyama. He does talk about the show on his blog, but in no relation to Pokemon. It's also possible someone just made the connection of long-haired guy with a rose plus written by Shudo and said, eh good enough. The site also says James has ties to Sarasvati Boy from the Kabuki Scoundrel of the White Waves, but no mention of those by Shudo either. Shudo also doesn't bring up wacky races anywhere, though the franchise has apparently been popular in Japan, so I kinda get that one. The site claims this fact came from a book called Pokemon Story, co-written by the show's executive producer, Mazakazu Kubo, and released in December 2000. I have sources with access to this book, but it's hundreds of pages long and mainly business focused. We're talking stuff like flight times and things people really don't need to know. There's good stuff in there, but to find a specific bit of info would take a lot of time and money I don't have. As of this recording though, Dogasu bought the book off Amazon and will look into the Muttley claim when he can, so I may have an update somewhere down the road on this one. Until then, I say all those inspirations are highly debatable or just outright bunk. By the way, that whole bit about Wabafed being based on that comedian, Sanpei Hayashiya, the one that would put his hand to his head and say, that's the way it is, ma'am? It's never been officially confirmed by Nintendo or Game Freak or somebody that that was the direct inspiration. I'm not saying it's not true. His son did even show up in an episode of Pokemon way back when, but it's just never been officially confirmed is all I'm saying. Now, I've talked about two of the show's producers already, but there's another one who didn't like Team Rocket too much. Shudo said this producer was the most outspoken of the bunch, and always complained about Team Rocket, saying they weren't important to the show. Shudo thought that's because they were the bad guys, though while this guy called a lot of shots, his opinions on Team Rocket almost never reached Shudo's ears. This producer was nicknamed Gozen-sama, but that doesn't give me much of a clue to who that could have been. My theory is that it was animation producer Toshiaki Okuno just by looking at this picture and process of elimination. All three of these guys still work on the show in some capacity today, 
but I'm not sure who it could have been if it was one of them to begin with. But as you know, the one thing Team Rocket is good at stealing is the hearts of fans, though I'd say Meowth was the most popular out the gate. Shudo said Meowth was chosen as a companion because it was equal parts charming and cunning, and for other staff who liked Meowth, they all seem to agree on that. In February of 2000, ABC News interviewed three of Pokemon's chief heads, which included the aforementioned Mazakazu Kubo. When everyone was asked their favorite Pokemon, Kubo said his was Meowth, and solely due to the show. One staffer who championed Meowth was Choji Yoshikawa, the anime's longtime associate producer who currently serves as its animation coordinator. Over the years, he's been pretty vocal about his love for Meowth, to the point he even did a side project with Enuko Inuyama, but more on that later. In 1999, Yoshikawa was interviewed about the Orange Islands arc, and when asked his favorite episodes of that bunch, they were Meowth-centric ones like Episode 96, Meowth Rules, and Episode 104, Bound for Trouble, citing Meowth as an interesting guy to follow. He went on to say that when they do episodes focused on Team Rocket's friendship, it always got a big reaction from fans, which was unthinkable when the show started. Side note, Shudo wanted Team Rocket to appeal more to adults than kids, but Yoshikawa said they were a big hit with fourth graders. According to him, I think it's maybe because we've cultivated Meowth, Jesse, and James into being these good bad guys. And that's why, looking ahead, we'd like to continue making Team Rocket the focus of one out of every ten episodes or so. Meowth also had love thrown his way from the Game Freak crew, namely Satoshi Tajiri himself. In an interview with Tajiri and Sunikazu Ishihara, the question came up of why Meowth was the only Pokemon who could talk. Ishihara said Tajiri made a chart and wagered each Pokemon's intelligence level on it, and for the anime, decided things like this Pokemon can understand human speech to this one could learn human speech, so I guess Meowth looked smart to the guy. Tajiri also said there was a good chance other Pokemon could speak as the show went on, and if you don't count legendaries, mind control, dreams, or telepathy, like you shouldn't, there's the talking Ghastly from episode 20, so maybe Ghastly was up there on Tajiri's smart chart. The only other Pokemon who could speak were Slowking and Manaphy in the second and ninth films respectively, and trust me, this does come back to Meowth. In a blog post for the Manaphy movie typed up by Yoshikawa, he notes how every prior movie mon used telepathy, but they broke tradition with Manaphy. It gradually learned human words, with Yoshikawa saying it fell in the same category as Meowth. Slow King talking makes sense because of how smart it is, but tying it to Meowth, in the dub, it was voiced by Nathan Price, Meowth's original English actor. You see, I brought it back. Speaking of dub actors, I want to give a mention to James Carter Cathcart, who's been the English voice of Meowth and James since season 9. He's adapted scripts for the dub since season 5, but he's also well-versed in music and has fittingly arranged some Meowth-related songs. He wrote English lyrics for the song Poruka o Doruka, or The Pokey Party Dance, featured in the Pikachu short Gotta Dance, which he also did adaptation work on. For 2001's Pokemon Christmas Bash album, half the songs were arranged under his music label, which included Meowth's Nobody Don't Like Christmas. In a panel he did in 2020, he said he did lyrics for another song, presumably from the X and Y series, but was told they couldn't get the rights to it. Maybe it was another Meowth song, who knows? As for voicing Meowth, he was very good friends with Meowth's previous actor, the late Matty Blaustein. According to Cathcart, the two talked about the show's production a lot, and as he wrote scripts, he got into Meowth's headspace and grew attached to him, hence all the stuff I mentioned. When the time came, he really wanted to give Meowth a shot, and has voiced him ever since. Now, I haven't talked about James a lot, and I looked for stories centered on him, but sadly came up short. Maybe there's some interview out there that eludes me, but I'll share this one fact that's been making the rounds. Many fans remember James's habit of cross-dressing for Team Rocket's disguises, but not only was it pretty infrequent, it was dropped by the end of the Ruby and Sapphire series, more or less. It wouldn't be until Sun and Moon, well over a decade later, where James donned a new look. This was so noteworthy, one of the show's veteran animators, Sayuri Ichishi, commented on it, saying, It's been a while since James is cross-dressed. Back when Pokemon first started airing in the US, we got complaints from them saying things like, cross-dressing's not allowed, but I heard we were able to get around that by saying, oh, that's just a character costume he's wearing. Ichishi also said its debut was with episode 28, Pokemon Fashion Flash. When designing the Rose of Versailles costumes for the two, they originally had Jessie wear the dress of Mary Antoinette, but they thought it didn't look right on her. So they put it on James 
James and went, hey, that kind of works actually, and the rest is history. The outfits themselves were iconic enough, they wore them again in the Ruby and Sapphire episode, I Feel Skitty. But wait, what about the time James made the coolest girl in episode 15? Well, Itchy, she doesn't count that. Though I will mention his hula get up in episode 22, and it seems she forgot about Beauty and the Beach, but I'll leave it at that. Since Sun and Moon, James has gotten one more get up in the Journeys episode, Mad About Blue. He still got it. If you keep tabs on the trio in Japan, you might know of their history in radio and music. The first instance of this was Inuko Inuyama's Pokemon Hour, broadcast in the greater Tokyo area from October 97 to March 2001, hosted by Inuyama and co-host Choji Yoshikawa. There were segments like Pokemon News, which shared postcards from fans, Ask Professor Yoshikawa, where he'd take listener questions about the anime, and the National Pokemon Cry Quiz, where listeners guessed Pokemon from their in-game cries, which I would have won easily. They also took listener pitches for merch, had first access to select updates, and actors from the anime would pop in as guests. In December 97, when the Pokemon Shock incident happened after Electric Soldier Porygon aired, the anime went on a four-month hiatus, but Inuyama assured fans the radio show would go on uninterrupted. During that time, they made an original audio drama called A White Tomorrow, Team Rocket. It played in three parts from April 5th to April 19th, 1998, and tied into the show's return to TV. The screenplay was done by Atsuhiro Tomioka, a writer for the anime since day one. He's known for his attention to continuity, and this drama is no exception. It takes place between the episode right before Porygon, Ditto's Mysterious Mansion, and the first one to air since Porygon, Pikachu's Goodbye, which aired three days before the drama's final part was broadcast. This also marks the debut of a character called Mondo, a bright-eyed rocket trainee who looks up to the trio and has a mad crush on Jesse. He's basically their errand boy, sending supplies to them from behind the scenes. They mention him sending the digging machine from episode 11, the liquid that made Tenacruel grow to insane size from episode 19, and pyrotechnics for their motto in episode 4. And when they need a new balloon, he's on the case. They come in different varieties too, but they're only allowed the Meowth ones for some reason. Not that Meowth minds. To sum up the actual story, the trio's reeling from a twerp thrashing when Mondo shows up with some food and money. He kisses up to his idols for a bit, and Jesse throws him a bone and battles him. He sends out a ditto against her Arbok, to which she wins, and they offer to raise ditto to make it stronger. By which I mean give it to the boss, making up for their last ditto scheme. Since their own Pokemon are too important, they trade Meowth in exchange. Understandably, he's ticked, but soon he's relieved not to deal with them anymore. Later in their balloon, Ditto mishears their orders and turns into a bunch of Pokemon and sends them crashing into a tree full of Beedrill. Weezing sends out a smoke signal, which Mondo and Meowth see, but Meowth wants none of that and goes off on his own. Mondo uses his Tauros to scare the Beedrill away, but they come back with a vengeance. But soon, Meowth comes in with the save and they fight the swarm off together. After that display, Mondo trades Meowth back to reunite the three. He then relays a report of a forest full of Pikachu, saying they might find Ash's Pikachu there. So the gang head there next as they bid Mondo farewell and make up amongst themselves. This clocks in at 40 minutes, and if you've never heard it before, you ought to. The trio's chemistry is fantastic, and it sounds like it came right out of the show. I followed along with an old fan translation that still gets the job done, but I'd kill to see a professional fan dub one day. This saw a physical release on November 11th, 1998 in what's called a sound picture box. You get a hardcover book with illustrations for the story, some Team Rocket production art, and a couple of extra songs, including lyrical versions of Gen 1's title and surf themes that need to be heard to be believed. I popped this in my PS3 and used the visualizer for the first time ever and I was in heaven. This is also the first thing I've imported from Japan and while not super rare, it's still a neat collector's item. Two songs on here were brought over from an earlier CD, Lucky Lucky, a song sung by James, and Roketto Dan no Aini, or Team Rocket Forever as some people call it. The latter song shares its name with the CD, with its lyrics written by Takeshi Shudo himself. And as luck would have it, he talks about its creation on his blog. In October 97, after writing the first volume of Pocket Monsters the Animation, he was asked to write lyrics for a Team Rocket image song for a CD. Given Meowth already had a song to himself, he focused on Jesse and James for this one. Shudo had experience writing for stage shows and did lyrics for a family musical, performed over 100 times no less. So he tackled that motif for their song. He said in a theme 
theater that seats over a thousand people for a family show. Half the audience is kids and they get antsy when they're bored, but there's ways to keep their interest. For this song, there's a main melody, but halfway in, things get more hectic, catching the listener off guard and keeping them on their toes. Soon there's bits of rapping, wordplay, ad-libbed conversation, they even recite the motto. It also references the maybe real, maybe not duel between Miyamoto Musashi and Sasaki Kojiro, including the real world location where it's said to have taken place. Shudo says he added that bit in as a joke. Once he got to writing, it took less than 30 minutes to put it all together. When the CD went on sale, it did extremely well, debuting at number 13 on the Oricon charts, which are like the US's Billboard charts. Of course, Pokemon helped with that, but Shudo was shocked that a song sung by supporting characters did so well, on top of being something he wrote, though he thinks it could have sold more if not for Pokemon Shock. The CD came out December 10th, the Porygon episode aired six days later, and you know the rest. On that note, a promo for the CD has some insane strobe effects, and Shudo says this aired during the Porygon episode. Like, jeez, man! This song debuted in the anime with episode 45, and later popped up in episode 70 and 243. In all these instances, they were kept in the dub, but only up to the first verse. It's also been used in the Hoenn and Sinnoh series, but in those cases, the dub swapped it out with Double Trouble from the To Be A Master album. You might say that's the American equivalent of their song, though some circles might not want to hear that. Team Rocket Forever's most recent appearance was in Black and White episode 109. At this point in the show, this song was a way of saying, we're gonna fix this, don't you worry. But what is this, you may ask? Again, we'll get to that. After A White Tomorrow, the Rocket showed up in a radio drama tying in with Mewtwo Strikes Back called The Birth of Mewtwo, written by Shudo after doing the movie. Once again, this introduced characters we wouldn't see anywhere else, like Giovanni's mother, the boss of Team Rocket before her son, and Miyamoto, the mother of Jesse. Note the Miyamoto Musashi naming scheme there. To skim on the stuff solely centered on Jesse, 20 years before the film's events, Miyamoto was looking for Mew, hoping the money she'd get from its capture would provide for her daughter. Her search takes her to South America, high in the Andes Mountains where she's caught in a blizzard. After catching a glimpse of Mew, an avalanche leaves her stranded with only a picture of Jesse to her name. Long after her daughter's grown up and Miyamoto's forgotten what she looks like, her search for Mew continues, but her current whereabouts are unknown. This played on Inuyama's radio show in five parts in the weeks leading up to Mewtwo's theatrical release. It got a retail release alongside the film's home video debut in February 99, again as a sound picture box with the movie soundtrack and art for the drama. And hey look, there's Mondo! Last time you'll ever see him again! Alright, I've been alluding to it for a while, so let's talk about the trio's depiction in black and white. At best, this was divisive. At worst, blasphemous. When this series started, they were billed as totally serious. No humor, no blast-offs, black uniforms, Wobbuffet was left behind, any Pokemon they caught had the personality of a brick. This was weird. Some were open to this direction, but after a while, people missed the old trio, and their actors actively hated the change. In a 2019 interview, Megumi Hayashibara said going from goofy to evil so suddenly was too much to bear, comparing the whole thing to boot camp. Inuyama mentions Meowth's human qualities in the past, but here he delivered serious lines if he even talked at all. These guys needed a way to unwind, so they started up a radio show where they'd be free to be themselves. From July 1st to December 23rd, 2012, Tokyo 76.1 Inner FM aired Pokemon Radio Show, Team Rocket's Secret Empire, where the trio try to enlist 7 billion recruits for their boss through the power of radio. The mastermind behind this was the anime's sound director, Masafumi Mima, who, you guessed it, has been with the show since day one. It took him a year and a half to get it off the ground, and he also handled writing and editing since they had no budget. Fitting for Team Rocket. Given everyone's schedules, the show was pre-recorded and scripted, but they wanted to give off the feel of a live show. Over 26 episodes, they did mini sketches, drew actual sketches of Pokemon by memory, and interviewed guests, all in character. One episode even featured their old rivals, Butch and Cassidy. Yeah, before 2021, I swore they died in the desert in Diamond and Pearl. This program bridged a serious gap we never got. These segments were later compiled and released on CD, with each member getting their own edition with extra goodies on each. If you got all three, you could receive a fourth edition exclusive to Japanese retailer Animate, what they call the 
rare pilot. In it, they spoke with Kunihiko Yuyama over the phone. Mima said the call wasn't arranged and could have easily gone to voicemail, and though he picked up, everyone was nervous. Jesse asked him what the plan was for the trio going forward, with Yuyama saying they'd soon go back to their roots. James asks why they get less screen time, and Yuyama said they did some tests and found they relied too much on them in the past, wanting to tell stories with just Ash and friends. Finally, Meowth asks which trio he likes the best, the new one or the old one. He doesn't give a concrete answer, just saying they started out serious in black and white and then less so. Meowth wonders if their actors had something to do with that. Yeah. Probably. At the end of Secret Empire's 13th episode, the anime was days away from airing part one of the Project Tempest two-parter, which the radio show advertised as the end of Team Rocket. No, not really. I remember hearing about this at the time and being kind of worried. Even the radio show said their second season would be hosted by Ash and Misty instead, but that's how they get you. They didn't go anywhere. Back in TV land, the gang slowly went back to normal after all this, but I say BW last episode is when they were 100%, because that's when Wobbuffet was back in the picture. At the end of Project Tempest, fans were asked which of the trio's old Pokemon should return, with a choice between Wobbuffet, Mime Jr., and Dustox. Given Dustox was, you know, released, and Wobbuffet showed up in some movie shorts at the time, and cameoed in the radio show, I mean, who'd you think was coming back? Sorry, Mime Jr., you know I still love you. When Secret Empire was ending for real, Mima and the gang had the idea of doing a live show, and after jumping through some hoops, their dreams came true in March 2013 with Team Rocket's Secret Live. And when I say live, I mean in front of a live audience with costumes and wigs all behind a curtain to keep the illusion. It really was Team Rocket in real life, capped off with everyone singing Team Rocket Forever. And if you want to hear about this show from the perspective of someone who was actually there, again, check out Dogasu's backpack. That guy does Arceus' work. Mima's been trying to do another Rocket event since since then, something grander than radio, but nothing's gotten the green light yet. Even so, he's still passionate about it, and why you ask? Well, because the trio won him over, and also as a favor to his old colleague Takeshi Shudo, saying he wants to make sure what he left behind is taken care of. That's really sweet, man. And since then, it's been quite a roller coaster for them. During X and Y, they put out two image songs, the big one being Team Rocket's team song, which has become their de facto theme in recent years. It's so Team Rocket, the lyrics were written by the trio, and it even references the Musashi Kojiro face-off, calling back to Team Rocket forever in a way. There was also Meowth's Ballad, which you might call a spiritual successor to Meowth's song. In fact, I say these XY songs are both updated takes to the original Rocket songs. They all even share a composer, Hirokazu Hip Tanaka, so my theory stands firm. The trio's done a few more live events too, namely during the Sun and Moon era, and one of which I mentioned in a top 10 I did, but even with all that, their attendance in the show is still pretty spotty. From their debut until the end of Diamond and Pearl, they were in every episode in some capacity before Black and White broke this streak. While I don't think they need to be in every episode, these absences can get pretty extreme, and in Journeys, it's hit an all-time low. In issue 83 of Spoon 2DI magazine, there was a 10-page Team Rocket feature, including a chat with Hayashibara, Inuyama, Miki, and Yuji Ueda, the voice of Wabafet. They noted how they don't show up a lot in Journeys, but when they do get something, all eyes are on them. The four still record together, with Megumi saying if the day ever came where they had to do their lines separately, she'd probably say, you know what? I'm out! They also think it's nuts how Team Rocket's still around when every other group has gone their separate ways. This all led up to an episode where, big surprise, they try their hand in radio in one big callback to Secret Empire. In the hours leading to the premiere, Team Rocket took over the anime's official Twitter, asking fans to get the hashtag Rocketodon Radio trending before the air date. And did fans deliver? It managed to hit number one for trending topics in Japan, and even in the top 10 worldwide with over 20,000 tweets. Also, Morpeko ASMR. No joke. This episode was scheduled for April 8th, 2022, which marked the trio's 25th anniversary of their debut in the anime. But that made too much sense to whoever's in charge, and they pushed it off to one week later. Why? No surprise here, but there's a lot of history centering Team Rocket, and I've only scratched the surface. For over a quarter century, they've entertained, 
influenced and inspired fans worldwide. There's people who don't like Pokemon who love Team Rocket, and they've had a big impact on me too, if this video and its length wasn't proof enough. From grade school to this day, I've known folks who say Team Rocket is the best part of a given episode. While debatable at worst, that's something Shudo envisioned at the very start, and if that's the legacy you leave behind, I say you did a good job. I can't imagine a world without them now, and even when things look their bleakest, they still find some way to surprise everybody. Their Japanese actors have said that in the future, they'd like their own Pikachu short or Team Rocket movie, another crack at radio, and of course, to be in the show more often. Well, whatever the future holds, I just hope they keep being themselves and have more moments to shine like the stars they are. Well, that was a crazy video, wasn't it? Thanks for watching, everybody. I really do appreciate it. I put everything I had into this one. Spent months just researching, writing, proofreading, editing. So if you enjoyed it or learned something you didn't know before, then give this video a like and share it with a friend or two. And if you'd like to support me more directly, then check out my Patreon. Those at the $5 and up tier can check out stories on the making of this video, including all the stuff I had translated, from what got in the video to what was left on the chopping block. Speaking of which, I want to give a very special thanks to Daniel Goldie Furlong for his amazing translation work, Dr. Lava for all the sources he provided, High Res Pokemon for their up resing prowess, and Dogasu's backpack for, well, all he's done these past two decades. Without you guys, this video would have been impossible. If you're looking for another Pokemon deep dive, I'd personally recommend the video I did on the English dub of the Pokemon anime and the long, complicated history surrounding it. And tell me, what are some of your favorite Team Rocket moments, or how has Team Rocket affected you in a positive way? Sound off in the comments below, I'd love to read them. And with all that said, I'll see you all next time for another installment in this month of Pokemon. Catch you later!